Hello, lovely people. We are back for more of I Put a Spell on You, the autobiography of Nina Simone. This is part 15. And uh, why don't we just get started where we left off? All right. So, yeah, she talked about making four women and um, just talked about just how she was feeling politically and personally and um, spoke to the feeling of being a black woman in America. All right. I didn't, oops. When I look, why don't we just start with the last powerful sentence that she said last time. And this is a long sentence, friends. This is a paragraph sentence. Um, I didn't suddenly, suddenly wake up one morning feeling dissatisfied. These feelings just became more and more intense until by the time the 60s ended, I'd looked in the mirror and see two faces, knowing that on one hand, I loved being black and being woman, and that, that on the other hand, it was my color and sex which had fucked me up in the first place. When I looked outside to my friends and their dreams, I found no consolation. The SNCC was dead in the water with its most talented members exiled or imprisoned and the rest of the argument the rest of them arguing amongst themselves core was going the same way the sclc was still trying to recover after losing martin the anti-war movement had distracted most of the white liberal support we had left every black political organization of importance had been infiltrated by the fbi by the way did y'all watch um judas the um yeah, the movie came out Friday on HBO Max. So, yeah. Police terrorized our communities. Many people refused to admit it, but the plain truth was that we were in retreat. In the movement, the great plans for a national reawakening were being replaced by local projects in individual cities. The attitude was no longer, what do we want, but what can we get? I'm wondering, um, how that same thing is or isn't happening after um, George Floyd, after the murdering of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, this past summer. So just wondering. The days when revolution had seemed possible were gone forever. I watched the survivors run for cover in community, community and academic programs and felt betrayed, partly by our own leaders, but mostly by white America. And I felt disgusted by my own innocence I had presumed we could change the world and had run down a dead end street, leaving my career, child and husband way behind, neglected. Optimists talked about the advances we'd made, but all I saw were lost opportunities. In March 1970, I played a concert in Newark, New Jersey, in front of a segregated audience, entirely black, and I was full of hate, tearing spitefully into political leaders of all races. Backstage after the show, I said I was an. <laughs> Backstage after the show, people said I was an inspiration of all races to continue the struggle, but that was the end of it all for me, the beginning of my withdrawal from political performances. The old arguments with Andy started up again. All right, I'll show you guys a few pictures that are in the book. I'm not going to read the captions though. her mother and her daughter. Her daughter went into like the Air Force, I think. U.S. Army is what she went into. This caption says, enjoying life back at the top, 1991. I had decided that to be less involved in the political performances, it seemed a good time to ease off all around, a natural break time. Andy didn't think so, and we argued on the same, 
we argued on the way to the Newport Jazz Festival and on the way back home. As usual, he refused to accept that I needed rest, and I realized he wasn't even sure I meant it. That I did. After all of those years of arguing, persuading, and begging, he didn't even believe I was serious about taking time off. Lisa was staying with Andy's mother, and I realized that for once, I could take the opportunity to do whatever I wanted without having to think of anyone else. So I walked out on Andy. I left my wedding ring on the bedroom dressing table and caught a plane to Barbados. It was the only thing I could do. Bar Barbados was heaven. I stayed at a hotel called Sam Lord's Castle and dedicated my life to becoming a beach bum. I swam, sunbathed, snorkeled, and took scuba diving le lessons. At night, I slept eight or nine hours straight through for the first time in years. I wallowed in everyday life like a prisoner released from death row, relishing, relishing each waking moment. I mastered scuba diving and spent half of each day teasing sea anemones and stroking their little tentacles, chasing fish around the reef and collecting conch shells for the guys in the kitchen to make conch soup and sea egg omelets. It was the first holiday I had for seven years and the first time I'd been alone for more than a few hours. For as far back as I could remember, I wanted never to leave. And in paradise, and America, I'm sorry, I was in paradise, and America didn't exist, had never existed. I knew Andy could find out where I was, but I heard nothing from him. That didn't concern me. I wasn't going to think about anything except getting my mind right and my body together. I figured we'd both benefit from a period of separation and get together again and sort things out when I came home. Leaving Andy wasn't calculated. It was an act of desperation to show him I was serious about needing rest and that if he wouldn't give it to me, then hell, I'd take it anyway. I hadn't said our marriage was over or that I was leaving him for good because I hadn't spoken to him at all. I just left one day before he got home. Leaving my ring on the dressing table didn't mean that I thought it was all over between us. I simply needed a vacation from my marriage for a while. I was booked to play San Francisco at the end of September and figured Andy would call sometime before we were due to leave. Oops, that made my face real big, but now I can't make it smaller. Sorry, friends. Big em, face em. Wanting to sort things out, when the date started to get close and there was no sign of him, I assumed he was being proud, just like a man, and wanted me to make the first move. So I caught a plane back to New York. I got home to Mount Vernon and found the house dark, nobody home. Inside, I looked around for signs of Andy, but there weren't any. No clothes, no toiletries, none of the little things around the house that I knew he liked. No food in the refrigerator, even the blackboard in the kitchen was gone. Okay, that is just so big. <laughs> Let me sit way back. All right. It was our first communication breakdown. I had left Andy in order to make a point about our marriage. And now he put up his hands and said, okay, if that's what you want, I quit. From the way he had moved out, I knew he wasn't coming back. I turned off the lights, locked up the house, and drove into the city to find a place to stay. To stay, Someone offered me an apartment and I took it. I wasn't ever going to live in that house again, not now. Everything to do with Mount Vernon was over. I sat in the San Francisco, I'm sorry, I did the San Francisco concert and then flew back to Barbados. A couple of days later, I was walking down the beach and I tripped and fell awkwardly. I broke a bone in my foot and tore some knee ligaments. I was released from the hospital a few days later in order to do nothing at all, just rest with my leg up, sitting there immobilized, unable to swim or scuba dive, bored with reading magazines. I sat staring out at the sea for hours, just thinking. I was on my own again. Andy was gone and the movement had walked out on me too, leaving me like a seduced scroll girl lost. I couldn't hole up in Barba Barbados forever. And I knew I had to use this time to work out what I was going to do. My most straightforward problem was money. I wasn't poor. 
but most of what I had earned over the years was tied up in my publishing and production companies, which Andy controlled. I talked to my brother Carol in California and he asked some hard questions about whether I knew how much there was, where their accounts, where the accounts were held and who controlled the assets. Andy had always been the one who took care of business and it frightened me how little I knew. While the situation with Andy was up in the air, in other words, until we divorced, getting control of my financial affairs was difficult. I dealt with Andy through my lawyer, Max Cohen, but Andy wasn't being too forthcoming and there was talk of tax problems and controlled audits, royalty disputes and sub-publishing agreements. My head span with the details. All I really understood was that it was going to take a long time to sort out. My concentration at this time wasn't good and one or two other matters distracted me when I should have been paying close attention. One of these distractions was a porter at the hotel, Paul, who became my lover. I met him on my very first day in Barbados and he showed me around the hotel complex. We got talking and he mentioned he had a motorcycle. When I told him I'd never ridden one, he offered to take me on a ride straight away and he did for miles and miles. Paul was a sweet guy and he had no idea who I was, which was important because it meant there were no hidden motives behind all the kindness he showed me. I was just a rich American lady as far as he was concerned and when I told him I was famous, he didn't believe me. Paul gave me all the attention and affection I'd been missing and I loved it, loved it. He took me riding on his motorcycle every day, took me to the movies, went swimming with me, everything all the fun things I hadn't done for years. We had a short, uncomplicated affair, which made me feel good about myself again. I liked Paul very much. In bed, he was a tender lover, and out of it, he was kind and gentle, nice to be around. No matter how much fun Paul was, I had to leave him behind and get back to the USA to try to sort out my affairs. Only after a few weeks away, things were beginning to pile up and no sooner had I dealt with one problem than another two or three appeared. Apart from having to deal with Andy, I had a series of concerts to play, musicians to organize, and Lisa to take care of. At the same time, I had to become familiar with the areas of my work I knew nothing about and I sat up at night reading about legal and commercial sides of show business. The sub-publisher of my songs, Ivan Mogul, helped me along with my old friend Max. The problem started to become more serious now. The Inland Revenue Service was starting to make inquiries about my income through the years I had been with Andy, but I didn't have access to my tax records because there had been a mysterious fire at our office and many of the documents they wanted had been destroyed. My record company was uneasy about my politics and took every opportunity to tell me so. The authorities in Mount Vernon began to harass me about the house, whether I was planning to live there again or sell it. There had been a flood, which had caused severe damage on the ground floor, and they wanted to know what I was going to do about it. Then the IRS came back and said if I wasn't any more cooperative, they might have to consider confiscating my property. With the first concerts of my next tour only weeks away and with them and with them the chance to earn some badly needed money, priority one was getting a tour party together. Musicians were no problem, but I needed to find a road manager who would take the everyday strain while I concentrated on performing. It had to be someone I could trust. I had an idea. My baby brother Sam was a grown man now and a musician in his own right. He knew all about life on the road. I decided to go back home to Philadelphia to talk the idea through with him. Of course, when I got home, there were a few other things that had to be cleared up first. When I told Mama that Andy and I had split, she wasn't too concerned. Broken marriages were what she expected from show business. Daddy didn't mind either. He'd never been too crazy about Andy. I didn't care what they thought anyway. Distracted as I was by all my troubles and depressed by the realization that I would have to deal with them until the day I die, probably from exhaustion, no doubt on stage, most likely in front of TV cameras. Andy had left me or I'd left him and then brought upon myself a terrible mess of debt, confusion, and deception. 
Those were the hard and lonely days. As usual, I had made a decision without thinking the consequences through, and within months of and within months, the structures that Andy and I had built together, which separated my professional and private lives, began to fall apart. I hadn't reckoned on the weight of responsibility I had to deal with once he was gone. Now I understood how difficult it had been for Andy to get me to concentrate on things that weren't directly to do with the movement, like overseas tours or recording sessions booked weeks in advance, which we realized later coincided with important marches or campaigns. And until I started managing myself, I never realized how skillful he'd been, not just in organizing my itinerary, but in saving me at least some private time, days when there was nothing to do but try to catch up on sleep, play with Lisa or go shopping, simple, everyday things. And it wasn't just that that he managed to arrange dates so that I could escape from the pressures when I had to. I remember cycling in London as if it were yesterday. It was the way he managed to keep me performing. I'm sorry. It was the way he managed to keep performing politics and our family life as separate ideas in my mind. If I was depressed about performing, I could be up about politics, which made performing more bearable and vice versa. If both of those depressed me, then I had Lisa and Andy. Damn him. As consolation, as something to cherish. But now, as I struggled on alone, everything fell into one pot and separate problems, separate depressions mixed together into one big black cloud. I began to believe all my troubles were pieces of the same problem, which was that I had been betrayed. America had betrayed me, betrayed my people, and stamped on our hopes. Andy had betrayed me too, and I felt let down by the black men who ran away from the showdown with, Ryan, with white America. Andy, because he was a black man, became partly responsible for that too. I blamed all of my problems on these enemies and I lost control, began to blame not just individuals but whole groups, Americans, the white man, men, record companies, promoters. I blamed them all. Excuse me. I felt like I was being attacked on all sides. The whole world was ganging up on Nina Simone. So I turned to the people that should be there when you need them the most, to my family, to daddy. Then he betrayed me too, and I was lost. All through my marriage, I had been sending money to my parents. One of the first things Andy and I did as a married couple was arrange a monthly check for them, which increased every year. Daddy hadn't earned a regular wage since he stopped working at the dry cleaning plant, and the burden fell all on Mama, who worked every hour she, who worked every hour she wasn't busy with the church. My folks had never been rich, and being able to help them made me feel wonderful. Of course, it was my duty as a daughter to do it, but that wasn't the point. It wasn't being able to make up for the sacrifices they had made for me, which made me glow inside. Mama never made it easy for me to repay her because she still felt uncomfortable with the life I led. So when I bought her a fur coat, although like many women, she loved it, she didn't feel it was entirely right to take it and I had to persuade her to. And once she did accept it, she wore it mainly around the house more than outdoors because she didn't want the neighbors to think she was putting on airs. That was mama. And while she made me want to tear my hair out sometimes, at least she was consistent. Daddy needed it less. It was mama who went out to work every day, tiring herself, doing what was needed to keep her home together. So that was the situation when I was down in Philadelphia seeing Sam and arranging the forthcoming tour with him, staying at my parents' home. One night, Daddy and Sam were in the kitchen talking, and I was on the phone in the other room. When my call finished, I got up and started walking to the kitchen. I heard the sound of Daddy's voice, low and soft, like he was telling a big secret, and I stopped in the passageway to try to listen. I strained my ears. Daddy was telling Sam how he had always been the one who provided the money in our family how he had always made a good home for Mama and us children, how no one should forget that. Okay, you guys, this...
because my face was just like all up in the cap camera. I stood there in the dark and listened to Daddy tell that lie after lie after lie to Sam. It wasn't true, none of it. And even Sam the baby, the youngest, had eyes and ears and brain enough to know what Mama did and how she worked every day, day after day. I stood there numb, unable to believe that Daddy would try to deceive Sam in this way. Daddy, who never lied about anything. I had been misused and cheated all my life, but up to that point, the one person I could rely on had been my father. The realization that he lied as well, like everyone else in the world, just crushed me. I felt the same disgust as when I heard the news of the Birmingham church bomb. And, and like then, it was the final straw. I had been years fighting for a lost cause. My marriage was over and my future was uncertain. After all the work I'd done, I didn't have the financial security. I couldn't even find out where most of the money was. All of the people I respected most had tricked and betrayed me. And now here was my father, who never lied, never doing the same thing. If I had had a gun in my hand, I might have killed him right there where he sat. As it was, I walked into the kitchen and told him he wasn't my daddy anymore because I disowned him. From that moment, I had no father. Then I walked out and daddy didn't say a word. I'm wondering on this part if if he was just telling Sam that or if he was receiving all those checks over the years and secretly cashing them and still allowing the mother to just work and work and work and work and work her fingers to the bone. I, I'm just, I can, I can see how like right now she just really needed for someone to be her rock, you know, with um, just, just the trouble she was going through and the, the, the breakup and the, the money troubles and all that. And with how this chapter proceeds, I'm just wondering like, what else that meant that her father was telling the Sam that like was he keeping the money private and just allowing the mother to work 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 herself to the bone I'm wondering that um I know a few people in my life who have felt like that happened with their husbands that that they are working 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 their fingers to the absolute bone and exhausted while their husband sort of just like does as little as possible in a way to kind of like the way that they've talked to me about it. And these people don't even know each other. They all feel like he would do less and less and less in a way to like fight them or punish them um, to make them have to work so hard and just exhaust them. Like kind of like his way of getting back at them or something. I don't know. And I'm just wondering if that's what happened or if he was just telling a, a more simple lie to the, to Sam. All right. Anyway, I left for Europe almost immediately and toured through the spring of 1971 in between visits to New York to try to sort out my financial and legal problems. I stayed in Barbados. Paul was around to indulge my taste for simple pleasures and every day on the island was a mercy, a way of keeping myself together. I tried not to think about daddy. The rest of the family figured our split was something we'd have to sort out between us and didn't try to interfere. For most of that year, I just drifted along trying to adjust to the changes in my life, separated from the things which had made me most secure. As Christmas approached, I joined up with Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland's Free the Army Tour and Anti-Vietnam Review, which mixed music, comedy, and protest. I just sang, keeping away from politics, a couple of the days after playing Philharmonic Hall in New York, we moved out to Fort Dix, New Jersey, to play a free show for black GIs who had come back from the war. This concert was the one condition I insisted on before agreeing to join the FTA show so that I could play at least one show for my own people. The GIs, only kids, most of them, sat quietly and listened. The weariest, oldest audience I ever saw, lost in their own thoughts. They had only just gotten back from the war and were finding America difficult to cope with. Them and me both. Daddy got worse and my sister, I'm sorry. Um, 
Back in Barbados, I got a call from Lucille. She said that daddy was sick and maybe I should come and see him. This was around 14 months after we split, but my mind was set. I would said that I didn't have a father anymore and that as far as I was concerned, that was true, whether he was sick or not. Daddy got worse and my sisters Dorothy and Frances both called me separately to say that he was asking for me. He was in the hospital in Shelby, a town near Forest City where Mama had been given her own church. I flew to North Carolina to be with my family, but I didn't go see him. Although everyone kept telling me Daddy's condition was worsening, I refused to worry, convinced he would get better any minute. I stayed at home with Mama for as long as I could as long as I could stand it. And then I moved to Tryon to stay with Ms. Mazzy. I had to get away from home because of the memories it brought back and living in the white world, one step removed from the situation was the only way I could endure it. I knew that if I'd stayed at Mama's any longer, I would have given in and gone to see Daddy. Daddy had cancer of the prostate and he was wasting away. Every day Dorothy or Francis would tell me how much weight he was losing and how he looked over and over again, he asked for me, and over and over again, I refused him. Nobody understood why I would go, wouldn't go to see him, and I couldn't explain it so they understand. Even when I look back now on the way I acted, I know it sounds unforgiving and proud, but I wasn't cold and unemotional. I knew I was hurting Daddy and hurting myself more, but there was nothing I could do. I was helpless because of the vow I'd made. The vow I had to obey. There are some stories um, in the Bible that I feel like um, kind of teach us that sometimes a vow is to be broken. But I, I keep those stories to myself and you can read them for yourself and see what you think. Most of the time when you make yourself a promise and say, I'll never do that again, it's unimportant and it doesn't matter if you break the promise the very next day, but this vow I had made not to see him was different and it clouded everything else. I knew deep down daddy knew I would have to keep it that vow. Deep down, he would understand. It wasn't pride which kept me away. I was confused, unforgiving, and I never admitted the seriousness of daddy's condition to myself, but I wasn't proud about what I was doing. I never thought, I'm right, and that's just all there is to it. Never. While my family while my family was at Daddy's side, I was walking the streets of Tryon trying to remind myself of the places that we'd lived and the times we'd known being with Daddy in a different way. I was booked to play at the Kennedy Center in Washington in the second week of October. I couldn't cancel because that would have been admission that daddy might die and I wasn't prepared to comp contemplate that. By the start of October, the disease had reduced my father to less than 90 pounds. I moved back up to Forest City and tried to prepare myself for the Washington concert. The closer the day of the show came, the weaker he got and still asked for me. The day before I was due to fly to the show, Lucille came back from the hospital. She didn't have to say anything. My daddy had died that afternoon. I felt nothing, nothing at all. I wasn't cold or indifferent to his death. It was as if my ability to experience emotion had been cut out of me and I was dead inside. I left for Washington the next afternoon and I flew. And as I flew, they buried daddy in Tryon in the graveyard on top of the hill behind the church. I wore black on stage that night and sang a new song with words I had been writing right up until the moment he died. Um, I just heard this song today and it, it's really ironic the, the way that she did it. It really does go like this. Now I'm not going to sing it perfectly, but the energy behind it is like a school girl, um, skipping. It goes, I remember this afternoon when my sister came into the room. She refused to say how my father was, but I knew he'd be dying soon. And I was oh so glad, and it was oh so sad, that I realized that I despised this man I'd once called father. 
and then it's hanging on with his fingers clutching dear. His body now just with his body now just 88 pounds. Blinded eyes still searching for some distant dream that faded away. Um, I forget the other the tune. He was dying alone naturally. And I was his favorite child. I'd had him a little while. Just as long as I could play the piano and smile, just a little smile. Just when I needed him most, he was already a ghost. And for all my life, there were promises and they always have been broke. Leaving me alone with all my troubles, dear. Not ever once touching me and saying, daughter, I'll help you get over. Now he's fading away. And so I'm glad to say he's dying at last, naturally. And it's a very sad thing to see that my mother with all her heart believes the words that the Bible said till death do us part. For her that was forever and day, he deceived her that night and day. How could some English word so small affect someone so strangely? So it kind of goes like that. Do 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 ba da 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 do 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 So the words next are taking her away from us, her soul included. She might as well be gone with him, all the children are included. Loneliness is hell. I know so very well, for I'm alone, naturally. I waited three. And then it kind of changes, like it gets real, it swells with the piano kind of big and dark. And then she goes, I waited three weeks for him to die. I waited three weeks for him to die. Every night he was calling on me. I wouldn't go to him. I waited three weeks for him to die. Three weeks for him to die. And after he died, after he died, every night I went out, every night I had to fight. I didn't matter who, it didn't matter who it was with because I knew what it was about. And if you could read between the lines, my daddy and I as close as flies. I loved him then and I love him still. That's why my heart's so broken. Leaving me to doubt God and his mercy. And if he really does exist, then why does he desert me? When he passed away, I smoked and drank all day, alone again, naturally. So that's the that's the song that she wrote about her daddy. And she sang, it's, you'll have to look it up. It's really something. I knew nothing about death. That was the curse on me. I never thought I wouldn't see him again. The idea that I could go back to trying to see daddy didn't hit me for a long, long time. And my realization that he was really gone, gone forever, was years and years away. I didn't think of him as gone. And so the split between us lasted right up until his death and beyond. A week later, Lucille was buried in the plot next to my father, struck down by cancer. A week later, right? That's her sister. Nobody had known how very ill Lucille had been as daddy wasted away. We knew she was sick and that the doctors had found a lump in her breast, but it didn't seem serious, at least not to the family, because Lucille had said nothing about it. And to look at her, you would have said that she was strong as ever. That was Lucille through and through, fighting her own battles in her own way alone. She hadn't told anybody. Maybe she thought she could stare death in the face and frighten him away like she could anyone else. I turned to stone and sighed. Lucille who stepped into my mother's shoes and taught me to be a woman, was gone. I tried to cry. I wanted to, but tears wouldn't come. What sort of person was I when sometimes I could cry for hours without knowing why and yet couldn't find a tear for Daddy and my beloved Lucille? What sort of person could break... What sort of person could break down and cry on stage in Europe over the deaths of political leaders and then refuse to visit her father's grave? What sort of person could do this? What had happened to make me this way? I had no answer to my own questions. I fled to Barbados pursued by ghosts. Daddy, Lucille, the movement, Martin, Malcolm, 
my marriage, my hopes. That was I Put a Spell on You, part 15. Thank you for joining.